Okay, so today we're going to start a series called The Ancient Hebrew Wedding Model. Now, for those that have maybe been in the walk a bit longer, are probably aware of, the, of this, especially what we're going to cover today. Today's going to be more foundational. Um, going through the ancient wedding ceremony and how... Uh, the reason I'm doing this is because Passover is just under 12 weeks away. And for some people that have um, not been doing this as long... Uh, you've probably only experienced the more traditional Passover uh, Seder and the more traditional understanding behind it. And one thing that I find in this, in the in the Torah Messianic movement, is that we Yeshua almost becomes a second place in the Passover. And there's so many things that we lose out on if we don't put Yeshua in the centre of it. Now. The reason I want to go through this series is that when we get to Passover, it will mean something more. You will see your Messiah in a different light, hopefully in a more intimate light. So we're going to look at the ancient Hebrew wedding models, but today we'll look more at the basic foundational stuff. Understanding this cultural aspect of scripture helps us understand scripture on a different level. Now, once you're aware of how things were done back then, you start seeing it everywhere in the scripture. Little hints here, little hints there, and you just get that, oh, I never saw it that way before. You just gain a deeper appreciation for it. It will help you understand things in regards to prophecy. Um, everyone loves talking about prophecy. Uh, I'm going to say this from the get-go. If you do not understand the cycle of the Moedim, and if you don't know how to wrap the ancient Hebrew wedding model around it, you, don't understand, you won't understand prophecy fully. I'm not saying you won't get it, but you won't get the, that deeper, intimate aspect to it. Again, once you're aware of these things, today what you'll find is that as I'm going through this, you're going to go, ah, oh, this is what Yeshua is talking about, or this is what that refers to. It helps us understand our relationship to our Messiah and our bridegroom. Hopefully, we're hoping to become the bride, not to just get into the kingdom. There's, we all know there's going, to be various, there's going to be hierarchy. Where do you want to be? It will help us understand our walk in this faith and how we ought to be acting, and more specifically, how we should be preparing, not just coasting along. So, let's get down to the, the basics Modern day weddings and the lead up to a, a wedding is very much different to what it used to be back in modern times. Uh, sorry, back in biblical times. There were several stages to a Hebrew wedding and each one was just as important. And uh, actually one thing that um, is quite different to the modern day, in the modern day it's the actual wedding day that's considered the big most important thing. In the Hebrew mindset it was right at the very beginning. These were the most important stages, and the final wedding was just a fulfillment of what was already laid down. So the first stage is called Shiduchin, and it's, it's essentially the matchmaking stage. The next stage after that was Erusin, the betrothal stage. Uh, we have a, a, a somewhat warped version of this called engagement. It's not the same as betrothal, as we'll find out. And then you have Denisuin. The marriage itself. Now, each one of these, there, there's various things that go within these three stages. Each stage had certain ceremonies and practices associated with it. And uh, we find hints of them throughout scripture. Again, you just have to know what you're looking at and where to look. Overtones of these can be found throughout the word. So let's look at Shiduchim. Genesis 2.18 says, Yah Elohim said it is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. It was Elohim that decided to choose the bride for Adam. Shiduchin refers to the preliminary arrangements prior to the legal betrothal. In ancient times, marriages were actually looked more as like an alliance between families as opposed to... Uh, it, it had this idea of survival, the well-being of the family, and practicality. 
Uh, we, we understand this in terms of royal terms. Kings would marry their children to kings of other countries for political reasons. This, it, it was a similar mentality, but more on a family level. Obviously, it wasn't completely devoid of emotion, though. Let's note that. The concept of romantic love actually remained a secondary issue, uh, if considered at all. But romantic love grew over time. And we're going to see an example of this, especially in the second half of this, today's teaching. It was generally the fathers that did the deliberating at this stage. The, the father of the bride and the father of the groom, and the groom would be involved in the deliberating, but... They, organized, they decided what would happen and what the conditions would be. It was common for children to be betrothed to each other. Uh, now, as we're going to see, betrothal was uh, you were legally together, but you weren't consummated. However, it was seldom that marriages were forced upon young people that had no interest for each other. So if... Obviously, the fathers would, would bring the two, the two people together, but if it just wasn't working, it wouldn't be forced generally. Now, it's worth noting that when children were betrothed to each other, the, whoever was too young or too immature would have to wait to be of age before there was a consummation. So we're not talking child brides and things like that. In ultra-Orthodox Judaism today, many marriages are still arranged by a marriage broker or matchmaker called a Shadchan. Uh, those of you who have seen Fiddler on the Roof will know that. It's considered an exalted and holy vocation to find and arrange a good marital match called a Shidduch between a man and a woman. We see this in Judges. And Shimshon went, Samson went down to Timnah and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. And he went up and informed his father and mother, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines, and now take her for me for a wife. See, Samson is talking to his parents, saying, you take her as a wife for me. But his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brothers or among all my people that you should take a wife from the uncircumcised Philistines? And Shimshon said to his father, take her for me, for she is pleasing in my eyes. Now, who's doing, we, we can see a hint here that Samson is asking his father, go and do the negotiation with this woman's father. This is why he's asking his parents. However, his father and mother did not know that this was of Yah, that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines, for at that time the Philistines were ruling over Israel. Then Shimshon went down to Timnah with his father and mother and came to the vineyards of Timnah. So th this is what was going on there. This is essentially, they were going to do a formal proposal. So you can imagine Samson's parents going over to this uh, woman's parents' house and saying, my son wants to marry your daughter. What can we do to make this happen? Thus would begin the process of setting the terms for the marriage if that proposal was accepted. The next stage is Erosin. So this is the betrothal stage. Now there's several components to this. Once the match had been made, the terms of marriage would be made and set in the form of a ketubah. So a ketubah, it's a contract. Don't think too much business-like, but it is kind of like that. The Ketubah was a legally binding document, and its primary purpose was actually to protect the bride. It was to protect the woman, as we will see. The father of the bride would use his wisdom to look out for the best interests of his daughter. So the, the father was responsible for, essentially, what happened to his daughter. Men, you have a very important role. Not only are you responsible for your wives but for your daughters. The bride was actually seen as being completely under the father's control. For example, if a man slept with a virgin, they generally got married, but the father had to consent. There has to be consent. As we see in Deuteronomy 22, 28, it says, when a man finds a girl who is a maiden, who is not engaged, and he seizes her and lies with her, and they are found out, then the man who lays with her shall give to the girl's father 50 pieces of silver, and she is to be his wife because he has humbled her. He is not allowed to put her away all his days. Now, 
these verses are actually used by those outside the camp, non-believers. Uh, we're going to tackle this probably in a future teaching, the laws of sexuality and how rape and what this is actually talking about, um, if that makes sense. Because atheists will use this just to basically make us look bad and to slander the word of Elohim. In Exodus 22, we have the counterpart to this passage. And when a man entices a woman who is not engaged and lies with her, he shall certainly pay the bride price for her to be his wife. This is the 50 shekels that we've just seen. If her father absolutely refuses to give her to him, he pays according to the bride price of maidens. So fornication was a very costly endeavor, shall we say. You, could, you would end up forking out 50 shekels and still not have a woman at the end of it. The ketub, now, the ketub consisted of several stipulations. The conditions and requirements of the groom and bride to each other. We would call that the vows on a basic level. But it would have gone into more detail. Like I, the, the, the groom would say to the bride, I promise that I will perform the duty of a husband. We will try and have children. I will provide this for you. I will protect you. And the wife, on the flip side, she will say, I will serve you. I will be the mother. I will be the woman of the house. The bride's estate inventory was listed in the original ketubas. And this was an accounting of assets such as money, property, livestock, and businesses usually given from the bride's father to, to bless her and send her on her way. And everything that this bride contributed to the marriage. So we, we, we call it nuptials, prenuptials. You know, when you sign a disclaimer, if whatever happens, I take this back. It's a form of that. We'll see later on why this is important. And the bride price. This was usually set at 50 shekels of silver because of what we've just read in Torah. And this was a cash penalty for a divorce without proper cause, so basically if it wasn't for the case of adultery, or taking a second wife without consent and permission from the bride and or her father. So it, it was only rich people that had more than one wife. And it didn't happen that often, actually. We think that it happened quite a lot. It was only royalty. And most of it was, it was more so that the, the woman had provision for her. It, it was different. The mentality was different. The dowry. In Hebrew, it's called the mohar. And this was the price of the bride paid by the groom's father and all the groom to the bride's father. We know it as a dowry. So all this was written in the ketubah, and this was part of the deliberations. This stage took quite a while, as you can imagine. The, you know, the father of the bride, well, I want this, I want that. My daughter needs this, my daughter needs that. And this is where the, the, a lot of the time was spent. In ancient days, marriages was not an agreement between two individuals, but between two families. Uh, now it's all about me, modern day, me, me, me. The newly married man usually did not find a new home for himself, but occupied a nook in his father's house. So they extended the, the family home. The family of the groom gained, but the family of the bride lost a valuable member who helped with all the household tasks. It was reasonable, therefore, the father of the bride received the equivalent of her value as a useful member of the family. This is what the dowry was about. So... It, when people look at this sort of way of doing the marriage thing, uh, modern day people automatically think that it's objectifying women by putting a price on them. It wasn't about the value of the woman. It was about you've lost, it, you've lost someone as part of the family household. That costs money. So th this was actually a form of honoring the family that was giving the bride, if that makes sense. This wasn't about debasing the woman. If anything, it honoured her family. She would have wanted her family to get a good dowry. Remember, back then, you know, if you didn't work, if you didn't live off the land, if you, did, you died. You, got, you went poor. These were, this was mainly an agrarian society, all hands on deck. My, my wife grew up on a farm. She understands this. If someone doesn't pull their weight or you're missing someone, it's hard work. In the course of time, the mohar lost its original meaning as a purchase price paid to the father for his daughter. And it actually became more of like the idea of a gift to the family, usually a very expensive gift. 
As far back as early biblical times, it was customary for a good father to give the whole of the mohar or the best part of it to the bride. So it, it essentially, it went back to the family, but it, it became the bride. And this would have become part of the, uh, the bridal inventory, so to speak, that we've just covered in the ketubah. A father who appropriated the whole mohar for himself was considered unkind and harsh. Well, I found a really interesting thing. So this idea of uh, the, the father giving back to the bride what he's being given. We know these verses, verses. All the tithe of the land, of the seed of the land, or of the fruit of the tree, it belongs to Yah. It is set apart to Yah. So think of this as something being given to the father. What does he do? He gives it back. And see, I have given the children of Levi all the tithes in Yisrael as an inheritance in return for the service in which they are serving, the service of the tent of meeting. I found, I think it's an interesting parallel almost that the father is giving back the mohar as it was. He doesn't need it, right? He's blessing. He's a good father. On top of the mohar, the groom will give costly gifts called the matan. To the bride as a sign of his commitment and as a sign of his promise to return for her. Now, the matan was usually given after the signing of the ketubah and where they would meet and the the groom would give her these gifts as a way of saying, I'm coming back for you. As we're going to see, they would spend at least a year apart after the ketubah was signed where the groom would go off and prepare a place. And this was his way of saying, remember me, I will come back for you. We see the Matan and the Mohar in scripture. The Shechem incident. And Shechem said to his father and her brothers, let me find favor in your eyes. Whatever you say to me, I give. So we know what's gone on. You know, he's, he's took Dina and they, they've had fornication. Ask of me a bride price, a Mohar, and a gift, a Matan, ever so high. And I give according to what you say to me, but give me the girl for a wife. If you look at the Hebrew, he's essentially saying, look, tell me what the dowry is and let me give her a really large gift. I just need her as a wife. So at least Shechem, he knew that what he did was wrong. He took the uh, Dina from out of the father's covering. But at least he's trying to make amends. He's trying to do right. It was actually uh, Levi, Levi and uh, Simeon that kind of... They're the ones that were actually unrighteous in all of this by the end of it. Now, once all the stipulations had been agreed upon, the proceedings of betrothal could occur. So everything's been hashed out. The ketubah's been written out. It gets signed. Now we can move forward. The groom and his father would go to the bride's father's house and they would knock on the door. This was like a ceremony almost. So everything, once everything was set in stone, this would occur. The bride's decision would then be made known by whether the door was opened or not. Now, this should sound familiar when Yeshua says in Revelation, I stand at the door and knock. It's it's an invitation to betrothal, to be in union. If opened, the groom and his father would share a covenantal meal with the bride and her family and partake of bread and wine. Now, again, in Revelation, what does it say? I stand at the door and knock. He who opens up, I shall come in to dine with him and he with me. This is wedding talk. But we read right over it. It just sounds really nice and poetic in our Western mindsets. Then would come the public ceremony of betrothal. So there would be the private thing where of the opening of the door, bread, wine. Then there would be a public one, right, by the mouth of two or three witnesses. The bride and the groom would undergo a mikveh in preparation for the betrothal ceremony. Then they would stand under a chuppah, the canopy, and the groom would give the chetan to his bride. This is when he would say, I will come back for you. He would give gifts to her. Now, again, Paul says that, and Yeshua gave gifts unto his people. The ketubah would then be signed. There were three copies of the ketubah. One for the father of the bride. One for the married couple. And a sealed copy for the local judicial court. And this would remain sealed 
And only a judge would be allowed to break that seal and open it should, as we're going to see later on, should there be mishaps and someone comes to the court and there's accusations. Once the ketubah was signed, the bride and groom were legally married and betrothed to one another. That's it. Like, but they hadn't consummated. Unfortunately, in the modern day, the, the modern equivalent of engagement is kind of... Even then, there's a lack of commitment. Like Even marriage nowadays, people think that when they marry, there's still a get-out clause. You know, when my wife and I got engaged, and it was with the idea that this is it. You know, there's no coming out of this. Unfortunately, people treat marriage very flippantly. However, consummation and cohabitation did not yet occur. So you were legally bound, but it wasn't consummated. The groom will go back to his father's house and prepare a place for him and his bride to dwell. Can you see, the whole time the bride is being protected, everything, because now the groom is forced, he's bound by contract. He has to go and prepare a place for his bride. It wasn't just, let's just quickly shack up, run off to Gretna Green and hope for the best. During this time, the bride would learn all about the groom and how to be a pleasing wife. She would learn to be a mother, a, a house mistress, and so forth. She would also prepare her wedding garments in preparation for the wedding. This should all be sounding very familiar, but she would make a wedding dress, basically. During the betrothal period, the bride and groom, they wouldn't see each other. So for a year, they wouldn't see each other. However, messages were usually passed between the two by the friend of the groom. We get, uh, let, let's think spiritually now for a second. If we, are, our groom is up in heaven right now, we're here on earth, who's the one doing the back and forth between the groom and us? We have the ruach for this. Okay, let's look at divorce and adultery quickly. Because even during betrothal, if you wanted to break that betrothal, you needed to get a divorce certificate. That You were bound. So when my wife and I got engaged, we had this understanding in mind. That's it. Even though we haven't had the wedding, we're together. That's it. We're bound. We'd made that commitment. This is how serious it was. But nowadays, you can get engaged and, well, you just pop your ring off and go, I'm sorry. You know, it's, there's no honour to it anymore. If the groom divorced his wife without due cause the, or, or committed adultery, not only would he have to pay the bride price, the 50 shekels, but he would also have to return the whole of the bride's inventory that was written in the ketubah. So let, let's just say that, you know, um, let, let's put, I'm going to use myself and my wife as an example. Um, she, she's going to kill me after. Um, but had I wanted to annul the betrothal, I would have had to pay the 50 shekels and give back everything that she was going to bring back because there wasn't due cause. And the only due cause we've read was adultery, uncoveredness, uncleanness. This is where actually the idea of putting away comes from. So people must have heard of the difference, you know, divorce, putting away, are they the same, are they different? The man would put his wife away without divorcing her, which meant he would get to keep all the assets. It was, re it was really, it was an underhand move. But basically, the man would go, he'd just send the woman away, and because there wasn't a divorce certificate, because it wasn't legal, and it hadn't gone to the judicial court, he kept it all. Now, this, this is what Yeshua is railing against. And as you can see, this actually puts the bride in a very vulnerable place now because she's lost everything, she's out on her own, she's probably being publicly shamed because it was a community life back then. This is what Yeshua was talking about, the putting away. Let's quickly read it. Um, it has been said, whoever puts his wife away, let him give her a certificate of divorce. But I say to you that whoever puts his, away his wife... Where's the certificate there? There's no certificate there. He's saying, whoever puts his wife away, except for the matter of whoring, makes her commit adultery. Why? She's still married. So if she's been sent out and there hasn't been... We'd call it separation today. 
So if a married couple then separates and the other person goes off, is that adultery? Absolutely it is. And whoever marries a woman who has been put away commits adultery. That's obvious. Now, yeah, in Matthew 19, this comes up again. The Pharisees came to him. They're trying him now. They're trying to test him. They're trying to catch him in his words, saying to him, is it right for a man to put away his wife for every reason? This is where they're trying to catch him out, for every reason. And he answering said to them, did you not read that he who made them at the beginning made them male and female? And he said, for this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife and the two shall become one flesh. So that they are no longer two, but one flesh. Therefore, what Elohim has joined together, let, not, let man not separate. What's really interesting, in, in the divorce is actually a form of murder. Because you've got something that's now one and you're tearing it apart. You've now, like the two are now one flesh. You've, you've, that's, it's a form of murder. This is why there's the death penalty for it, by the way. They said to him... Why then did Moshe command to give a certificate of divorce and to put her away? He said, because of the hardness of your hearts, Moshe allowed you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. And I say to you, whoever puts away his wife, except on the ground of whoring and marries another, commits adultery. And whoever marries her who has been put away commits adultery. Remember that adultery essentially broke the covenant. It was essentially shattering the stone tablets on the floor. Now, let's put this in context back of Torah. Yeshua can't be speaking against Torah. So let's actually see what the command says. In Deuteronomy 24, it says, When a man takes a wife and shall marry her, then it shall be, if she finds no favor in his eyes, because he has found a matter of uncoveredness in her. Uh, unclean act. This is talking of um, ba- basically extramarital uh, relations. He shall write her a certificate of divorce, put it in her hand, and send her out of his house. There's a process. Written legal document, give it to her, send her out. Now, certificate of divorce, the Hebrew, uh, the certificate is sefer, which means book or written document. And for divorce is kritut. And it literally means a cutting, a cutting of something. So it's a certificate of a breaking. It's, because remember, the marriage was a legal binding thing. So you need a legal binding thing to undo it. But the only excuse you have is adultery. You can't just... There was this whole argument in the first century, by the way, between the school of Hillel and the school of Shammai. And one school said that you can only divorce your wife because of adultery. The other school said, oh, she's burnt the dinner, divorce her sort of thing, put her away. And th- this is why this issue is being brought to Yeshua. And if she left his house and went and became another man's wife, is that a sin? She's got a certificate of divorce. She's got a certificate of divorce. So far, there's no sin going on. And the latter husband shall hate her and write her a certificate of divorce and put it in her hand and send her out to be his wife. Or when the latter husband dies, who took her to be his wife. So see, now the certificate of divorce has has the same power as the husband dying. Please note, verse 3, certificate of divorce with grounds for divorce and the death of a husband. They, They do the same thing. Then the former husband who sent her away is not allowed to take her back to be his wife after she has been defiled, for that would be an abomination before Yah. That now comes the sin. You can't divorce a woman. Her go some well, once she's divorced, that's it. She's off limits. She can't come back to you. Unless he dies first. And do not bring sin on the land which Yah your Elohim has given you as an inheritance. The problem in the first century, and even before that, as early as Malachi, the problem was that men were sending women away without a certificate of divorce. They wanted to keep the bridal inventory. The woman, this actually, it put her in a vulnerable state. She would have been publicly shamed. Now, back then, there was honor shame going on. So not only was she shamed, but so was her father's house. Now, this is what is spoken of in Malachi. Everyone knows God hates divorce, right? Let's actually look at this.
passage. Uh, verse 13, chapter 2. This is what you have done a second time. You cover the altar of Yah with tears, with weeping and crying, because he no longer regards the offering, nor receives it with pleasure from your hands. And you said, why? Because Yah has been witness between you and the wife of your youth, against whom you have acted treacherously, though she is your companion and the wife of your covenant. And did he not make one, like the two people, and he had the remnant of the spirit. What is the one alone? He seeks a seed of Elohim. So you shall guard your spirit and let none act treacherously against the wife of his youth. If you read the context, the Israelites had, had married a wife and then were marrying pagan women. And Yah was coming against this. For I hate divorce. And this is where people say, that's it, you can't have divorce. Says Yah Elohim of Yisrael. And the one who covers his garment with cruelty, said Yah of hosts, so you shall guard your spirit and do not act treacherously. This is from the ISR. The King James actually got this right for once. They translate this correctly. The word for divorce there is shalach, which means to send out, to put away. When we read Deuteronomy and it says, you shall give her a certificate of divorce and then send her away, you shall give her the sefer kritut, the handwritten document, and then you shall shalach her. You have to give her the document before you send her out. If not, she becomes an adulteress. There's no mention here of a certificate of divorce. And the context of Malachi here, you can read it in the chapter, it's about men that were marrying foreign women even though they are already married an Israelite. They were probably thinking, oh, she's better looking, you know, on you go, love. I'm keeping all your, your assets, by the way. And this is what Yah hates sending away. It's unrighteous. Everyone with me so far? Cool. Hmm? Well, I want to, while we're on the thing of divorce, Yeshua said that actually it wasn't so at the beginning. A man and a woman were meant to stay together. Now, they need, I'm, I'm just going to say this, there has to be very good grounds for divorce. You know, adultery, the man is battering his wife, things like that. Now, you know, this is a sheer breaking of covenant. But I want to suggest that if you are Torah observant, you are fully walking in the character of Messiah, there should be no reason for you to divorce. Because if you're fully walking as he is, you're, you're laying your life down. The man needs to lay his life down for the bride. Why wouldn't a woman want to be with a man that lays his life down for her? Why would... Do you see what I mean? And the woman, she's serving the man and being in a help me. Why would the man not want to stay? So I want to, you know, if, if you say you're walking in Torah and you're following, uh, walking in his character, there shouldn't be any grounds for divorce. I'm sorry. Uh, so if there is something going on, there's, there's something else at play. Let's look at the Nisuin. So the Nisuin is, it comes from the word, it means to take. The groom comes and he takes his bride. This is after the year of betrothal and we'll see how this goes. It comes from the word Nasu, which means to lift up. Not only would the groom come to take his bride, he would honour her and lift her up. This is why they use it. So I love the Hebrew here. There's this kind of like word play between he's taking her, but he's also, he's exalting her. When the groom came for his bride, there was a great procession of joy, jubilation and shofar blasts. So the, the groom would come and there would be a great procession and there would literally be blowing shofar saying, the groom is coming, the groom is coming. The bride would see the light of the procession in the night. These ceremonies usually happened at night. And she would have to go out and follow the light and go meet her groom. Now, how do you get around in the dark back then? With, with a lamp. With a lamp. So she would have to have a lamp ready and go out and meet her groom. She would light her oil lamp and go out and meet him. I, I love this because... The, the groom has gone all the way from his father's house and gone over there and the, the woman has to watch for that glimmer of light and hear the sound of the shofar and then she has to go out to him. The, this idea of, um, in James it says, uh, draw, 
draw near to Elohim and he shall draw near unto you. It's a two-way thing. It's just so beautiful. Although the bride knew to expect her groom after about a year, sometimes it was more, it, um, she did not know the exact day or hour. It was the father of the groom who gave the final approval for him to return to collect his bride. It was, the, the groom wasn't allowed to just go, okay, today's the day. It was the father of the groom that says, son, you're ready. You're ready to be a husband and you're ready not to provide for your family. Again, men, you have an important role in bringing up your sons to be men, according to scripture, not, you know, what you see out in the modern day, you know, males that are not men. <laughs> For that reason, the bride kept her oil lamps ready at all times as the groom usually came in the night. She, it, it, it was a bit of a surprise visit, so to speak. The groom would then take his bride and take her back to his father's house to consummate and celebrate. The couple would finalize their vows and drink a cup of wine to signify their union. So there's a cup of wine and, uh, and a covenant meal at the betrothal, and now you have one at the consummation. So let's look at this. It wasn't just straightforward, you know, they do what they have to do. Even this had uh, a set way, a set uh, sequence of events. There was a procedure to the consummation. The bride might have up to 10 friends who would act as witnesses to the event. Yeah, it just sounds very familiar, doesn't it? You know, oil lamps, 10 people, 10 witnesses. Now, they, the mother of the bride and or the bride herself they would sew a name of the couple on the cloth, right? I think people know where I'm going with this. This was called the proof of virginity, that the bride would bleed on as she lay on top of it during the consummation. Both the groom and the bride would assign several formal witnesses to the event, and they, would, they wouldn't be in the room, but they would wait outside or in an adjoining room while the couple consummated the marriage in the wedding, in the wedding bed. So the bride would have up to 10 witnesses. This is where the idea of a bridal party comes from, by the way. How many witnesses do you think the groom had? Two. Two witnesses. Does that sound familiar? Two witnesses announcing the coming of the groom. Sounds familiar? Hmm. It should do. This is where the parable, of the, the parable of the 10 virgins come in. So let's just break this down quickly. The bride's ten virgins, they're the witnesses, and they would walk to the, with the bride in a ceremony to the wedding feast of the house for the groom. So the bride is waiting, she would have her friends ready on standby as well. As the bride was waiting for the groom to arrive and take her to his father's house, the ten, we know, they fall asleep because of the delay of the groom. Once the groom arrives, the male witnesses of the groom would announce his arrival with a shofar and calls from his own voice to the bride and, and her maidens. This is where the two witnesses commit. The, and one of these witnesses would have been the friend of the groom. That it, This is how it worked back in ancient times, where he would go between the groom and the bride to send messages. You know, this is where... I, it's, it's, almost, it's really cute and romantic, this idea of love letters and love messages and... It should bring up the Song of Solomon in our mind. At this point, they trimmed their lamps, which had been burning, and the wise virgins had taken extra oil because of the delay. As the groom takes his bride to the chuppah room, a celebration party begins in the outside room, and the five foolish virgins run to buy the extra oil. So what would have happened is that the groom would have came, taken the bride, the bridal party would have gone, there would have been this great big fanfare, and they go back to the groom's house for the consummation and for the party, essentially. Now, this is where the five foolish are off to buy oil during, when it's dark as well. Uh, the entire wedding party make their way to the groom's house and the door is closed when the last person in the procession enters and th they used to lock the door. This is where the five foolish virgins arrive, knock on the closed door and are told, I never knew you and are forbidden to enter the wedding feast. Now, the groom, these were the witnesses of the bride. So the groom didn't know them. Now, when it says, I never knew you, what's usually the tagline that goes with it? You who work lawlessness 
So let's remember what it means to know him intimately. I've said this before, many people claim to know him and do everything that he hates. The chuppah that was used in the betrothal ceremony was used as a covering for the marriage bed. Uh, this varied, by the way. Sometimes it was over the marriage bed. Sometimes it was where they would do the public ceremony. It, it depended. There's actually like some discrepancies here. Once the marriage was consummated, the groom would hand the proof of virginity to the witnesses and the celebrations would begin. So they would be waiting in the room and it was, there was a lot hanging on this, shall we say. <laughs> yeah, no pressure, right? <laughs> yeah, I always kind of feel sorry for the women on this one, I'll be honest. Great importance was put upon the virginity of the bride. If she wasn't found a virgin, what happened? She could be stoned. So you can imagine when the groom came out with great joy and says, you know, here it is. There was elation and relief and this is part of the reason why you needed to celebrate. The witnesses were there for the specific job of confirming the bride's virginity. The bride's parents wanted to know and so did the, the uh, groom's parents. People needed to know. Let's look at where this comes from in Deuteronomy 22. When, a man, when any man takes a wife and shall go into her and shall hate her, so they're consummating and he decides, uh, and shall make abusive charges against her and bring an evil name on her and say, I took this woman and when I came to her, I did not find her a maiden. Then the father and the mother of the young woman shall take and bring out the proof of the girl's maidenhood to the elders at the gate. This is why it was very important. And the girl's fathers shall say to the elders, I gave my daughter to this man as a wife and he hates her. And see, he has made abusive charges against her, saying, I did not find your daughter a maiden, and yet these are the proofs of my daughter's maidenhood. And they shall spread the garment out before the elders of the city. And the elders of that city shall take that man and punish him and find him 100 pieces of silver and give them the father of the young woman because he has brought an evil name on the maiden of Yisrael. And she is to be his wife. He's not allowed to put her away all of his days. Because, again, this is an honor and shame thing. Going. This is protection of the woman. But if the matter is true that the girl was not found a maiden... They shall bring out the girl to the door of the father's house and the men of her city shall stone her to death with stones because she has done wickedness in Israel to whore in her father's house. Thus you shall purge the evil from your midst. This is what, so you can imagine when this consummation was going on, it was like the parents were praying, please, 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 right? Remember, if the bride was actually found guilty of adultery, She'd lose everything, usually her own life with it. The groom would actually keep the whole bridal inventory with it because the fault was on her. There was a lot at stake. Now, the bride price was 50 shekels of silver. We covered this earlier. And here, the cost of accusation of harlotry was 100 shekels of silver. Now, this means nothing to us, right? What, what does this mean? So let's put it into modern terms. We've done this before with um, a Torah portion. One denarius, so is, which is the same as a silver dime in America, was a day's wage. So in the first century, a silver denarii was what you got for a day's wage. This was true right up until the 19th century in America. You had a silver dime as a day's wage. So for almost 2,000 years, the money stayed the same. Now... As of April this year, minimum wage goes up to 8.21, so everyone's thinking, yes. Um, but you work 12 hours back then, not eight hours a day. So that means that a silver denarii, or a silver dime, one day's wage is 98 pounds and 52 pence. Let's call it, let's call it 100. Now, yeah, so a denarius, a dime, near enough 100 pounds. Now, there's 14 denarii or 14 silver dimes to one ounce, one ounce of silver. So one ounce is basically 1,379 pounds, an ounce of silver, in terms of monetary value. Now, one shekel is 0.4 of an ounce, which means that five shekels is two ounces, which means that five shekels is equivalent to 28 days' wages, 
You, I, I've done it this way. You can pause the video and check my maths. <laughs> that means five shekels is nearly 2,800 pounds. Five shekels. So remember, now we're talking bride price, 50 shekels. So it puts it back in. Let's keep going. A half shekel, which was the redemption of souls, works out to 275 pounds, which is five and a half days wages. That was the redemption that you, you paid to the tabernacle. 30 shekels, which is what Yeshua was bought for or uh, sold for, 16,000 pounds, 550 or 168 days wages. Because we think, ah, oh, 30 pieces of silver. This, and remember, these are minimum values. I'm going off minimum wage, so it's probably more. What would you do for 16 grand? I don't know what that is in rand. <laughs> 50 shekels, the price of fornication, £27,586. That was 209 and 10 months' wages. Now, remember, if you were found fornicating, you would have to pay that to the father of the, bride, of the girl, and he could still say no. You're now nine, ten months out of pocket, and you don't have anything to show for it other than shame. By the way, this was because back then, if you weren't a virgin, you were a lot less likely to be remarried. So it was to make up for the fact. 100 shekels is 55,000 pounds. The accusation of harlotry, one and a half years' wages. So if you accused your newly married wife and you were found to be a liar, that's the fine you had. Hopefully that puts it back, because people think... This is one of the things that non-believers will throw at the believer. Ah, oh, look, 30 pieces of silver. It's not, this was a lot of money. This was enough to be having to sell yourself to someone to pay off a debt. I hope that puts it into a better perspective. Nowadays, you can just sleep around. It will cost you probably an STD, but... This is why when the proofs of virginity were presented, there was great joy and elation and the celebrations could begin. It, was, it would have been a very tense moment. Now, this is really interesting. John 3.29. This is uh, Yohanan the Immerser, John the Baptist. He that has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the voice of the bridegroom. So this joy of mine is complete. This is talking of the witness standing outside when the bridegroom will come out and go, it, it is done. There will be great rejoicing. Knowing all this, everything we've covered so far, now let's look at Miriam and Yosef. But the birth of Yeshua Messiah was as follows. After his mother Miriam was engaged to Yosef, before they came together, she was found to be pregnant from the set-apart spirit. So they're engaged, they're betrothed, but before they, came, before they consummated. So Miriam and Yosef are actually, they're legally married, they're in betrothal, they're quote-unquote engaged. So you can imagine, this is a bit of a tough spot for Miriam to be in. And Yosef, her husband, being righteous, not wishing to make a show of her, had in mind to put her away secretly. He, was gonna, he wasn't going to do it publicly. He, he had every ground to say, you harlot, and would have probably won the court law, the, the, the case. But while he thought about this, see, a messenger of Yah appeared to him in a dream, saying, Yosef, son of David, do not be afraid to take Miriam as your wife, for that which is in her was brought forth from the set-apart spirit. And she shall give birth to a son, and you shall call his name Yeshua, for he shall save his people from their sins. And all this came to be in order to fill what was spoken by Yah through the prophet, saying, See, a maiden shall conceive, and she shall give birth to a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means El with us. And Yosef, awaking from his sleep, did as the messenger of Yah commanded him, and took his wife. See, they haven't, she's still considered a wife but knew her not until she gave birth to her son, the firstborn, and he called his name Yeshua. So you can imagine already, there would have probably been whispers about Miriam. She would have been accused of basically playing the harlot. She got pregnant before, because everyone knew when the, wed like, the wedding was a big thing. 
And people would have seen, hang on, they're betrothed. Why is she pregnant? What's going on? I'll go as far as saying this, that Yeshua might have even been called son of a whore because of the circumstance this happened. Yosef and the father of Miriam would have signed a ketubah and they would have been legally married. So put yourself, they've signed a ketubah, they're betrothed. She's given the inventory of assets. Everything's, you know, on the books. Miriam was in a vulnerable position and at the mercy of her husband. She was pregnant before the chuppah. She wouldn't have had a virginity cloth, or the proof of maidenhood. Now, this is what was used in an in a accusation of harlotry. Now, he says Yosef was a righteous man. He did not want to disgrace her, even though he believed she was an adulteress. This is why he wanted to put her away. Because at first, he would have thought, hang on, I haven't slept with her. Remember, they're not living together at the time as well. We know that for a period of time, she was with Elizabeth, her cousin. He was going to divorce her secretly and merely hand her the get. The get is another word for the certificate of divorce without making an accusation of adultery. Now, to the legal court, this would have looked like divorce without a cause because there was, he, didn't want, he did it in secret. He didn't want to make a big show and dance of it. Had Joseph divorced her without accusation of adultery, he would have been required to return the inventory of assets to the, of the bride that she'd brought in, and he would have had to pay the bride price to the father, right? So how much? 50 shekels, over 25,000 pounds. And he hadn't done anything wrong. He had legal ground to accuse her and keep everything whilst not have to pay the 50 shekels. Sorry, 27,000 pounds. Yosef had everything to gain by openly accusing her, but it would have cost him much to divorce her secretly. And he'd made that decision. He was willing to take the hit. How many divorcing spouses would give up a solid, winnable legal position in court and adopt the losing position, merely to protect the reputation of their spouse as a great personal financial disaster? It puts Joseph in a, in a different light. He truly was a righteous man. But th 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 this is what it means to die to self, to lay your life down. So Joseph had two choices. Divorce Miriam for cause... Miriam's reputation harmed, probably stoned in the process. Yosef keeps the bridal inventory. Yosef does not pay 50 shekels, 27,000 pounds. Or he divorces secretly for no cause. Yosef's reputation harmed. Yosef gives back the bridal inventory. Yosef must pay 50 shekels. What would you do? Yeah. Uh, it's, um, you know, we, we like to say, oh, I would do the righteous thing. Come on. <laughs> All right, let's, last little section. Once the marriage had been consummated, there was a huge celebration and it lasted for seven days. What feast do we have? That's a great celebration for seven days, right? These celebrations usually happened after the harvest. Oh, funny that. When there was plenty of fruit, wine, and general joy. Like your hard work, the year's hard work is done. You can kick back a little bit. You know, you've got that moment's peace. Let, let's have a great, you know, let's have a wedding. These celebrations happened at the groom's place, which he had prepared at his father's house. What did Yeshua say? I go to prepare a place for you. Let's take a break here. And so this is just the foundation, the ceremony itself, and how everything would have played out. Now in the second half, we're going to see actual scriptural examples of this. Okay, the second half. Let's take what we've learned and looked at in the first half, and let's start looking for it in the scriptures. Because if it isn't in scripture, well then, what's the point, right? <laughs> so, we have a good outline of what the ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony and process is. We know the various stages. Um, a lot of people will say, well, why haven't I seen it before in scripture? When you, you, you don't know what you don't know. So if you don't, you're not aware of it, you're not going to see it. The fact is that it's actually all over. 
you just have to know what you're looking for and where to look. And you just have to understand the culture and the context. So let's do a quick recap of what the stages are. You had Shiduchim, which was the matchmaking, uh, finding a match, and setting out the terms of covenant. This was done by the fathers. Then we had Erusim, which was the betrothal. The bride and groom would undergo the mikveh. There was the giving of the chatan, so the groom would give the gifts over to the bride as a sign that he's coming back. And then there would be the signing of the ketubah. Then there would be the covenantal meal and the cup of wine. And then we had the nisuin. So you have the groom coming to take his bride home, announced by his uh, two witnesses. The finalization of the vows and the cup of wine and the consummation. And then there would be the big wedding feasts. So let's look at Genesis 24. This is a well-known story and it's a beautiful type and shadow, actually. So whilst we go through this, constantly think of how this relates to us and our Heavenly Father. And Abraham was old, advanced in years, and Yah had blessed Abraham in every way. And Abraham said to the oldest servant of his house, who ruled over all that he had, please put your hand under my thigh, so that I make you swear by Yah, the Elohim of the heavens and the Elohim of the earth, that you do not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites, among whom I dwell. But go to my land and to my relatives and take a wife for my, for my son Yitzchak. And the servant said to him, what if the woman refuses to follow me to this land? Do I then take your son back to the land from which you came? And Abraham said to him, beware lest you take my son back there. Ya Elohim of the heavens who took me from my father's house and from the land of my relatives and who spoke to me and swore to me saying to your seed I give this land. He sends his messenger before you and you shall take a wife from, for my son from there. And if the woman refuses you to follow you, then you shall be released from this oath. Only do not take my son back there. Then the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. We actually see the beginning stages of Shiduchin here. Remember, it was the father who deliberated and chose, it was the father of the bride and the groom. And we see the same here. Abraham is saying, my son needs a wife. And, but... In this case, he's given it the responsibility to his servant. We see that Abraham is the one responsible for choosing a bride. Yet he passes the duty over to his servant to find a bride for his son. So already, like, think about this. It's in the spiritual sense. Like, we're hoping to be the bride of Messiah. And if uh, we, we're going to see here, think of Abraham as the father, Yitzchak as the son, as Yeshua, and Eliezer, the servant, as the Ruach, the spirit that's going forth and is the spirit that had to go and select the bride. You have this beautiful picture of the spirit drawing people near and doing the heart circumcision and writing that ketubah on our hearts. Let's keep going. And watch, so this is, the servant has now got to the land. He's found um, Rivka. Rebecca, and watching her, the man remained silent in order to know whether Yah had prospered his way or not. So he's at the well, and it came to be when the camels had finished drinking that the man took a golden nose ring weighing half a shekel and two bracelets for her wrist weighing ten shekels of gold. Now, these were initial gifts to woo the bride. He, he wants to get her attention. They're not the chatan. The chatan will come later. But, right, it's the classic man chasing the woman. This time it's the servant that's chasing for his, uh, for his master's son. Let's keep going. And Rivka had a brother whose name was Levan, and Levan right, ran out to the man, to the fountain. And it came to be when he saw the nose ring and the bracelets on his sister's wrists, and when he heard the words of his sister Rivka saying, thus the man spoke to me, that he went to the man and saw him standing by the camels at the fountain. And he said, come in, O blessed of Yah, why do you stand outside? I myself have prepared the house and a place for the camels. Notice that he sees the gold. He's like, ooh. Remember that marriages were often done with survival and welfare in mind. And that marriages were between families as opposed to individuals. 
So we're, we're going to see Levan, where his heart was actually in this. Knowing what we know about Levan, now Levan means white in Hebrew, yet we know he was a bit of a slippery character, right? Changed wages ten times and so forth. So you have this idea of whitewashed tombing, white on the outside, you know, evil inside. It's easy to see why he wanted to marry Rivka off, especially with the terms that Eliezer proceeded to give. You've got to think, like, the bracelets, they were costly. We've just read that Abraham was blessed in every way. He was rich, like filthy rich by our today's standard. Let's see the terms that the servant sets up. So the man came into the house while he unloaded the camels and provided straw and fodder for the camels and water to wash his feet and the feet of the men who were with him and set food before him to eat. But he said, let me not eat until I have spoken my word. And he said, speak on. And he said, I am Abraham's servant. And Yah has blessed my master exceedingly, and he has become great. He has given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and male and female servants and camels and donkeys. So we can see the, the, the father, uh, Betuel and Levan, are probably thinking, oh, this sounds good. This is a good deal, you know, because they would have been benefiting from this. And Sarah, my master's wife, bore a son to my master when she was old. And she has given to him all that he has. And he has given to him all that he has. Sorry there. And my master made me swear, saying, Do not take a wife from, for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites in whose land I dwell, but go to my father's house and to my relatives and take a wife for my son. So he's making it very clear. I've come here for a wife for my master's son. He's setting out the conditions and Levan answered, and Bethuel too. Bethuel was the father. Levan, I think he was her brother, but he was, it seems that Levan was in charge. And said, the matter comes from Yah. We are not able to speak to you either evil or good. See, Rivka is before you. Take her and go and let her be your master's son's wife, as Yah has spoken. Who's got the authority to give Rivka away? It, it, the father and the man in charge. Uh, uh, read the story. Up until this point, we haven't heard anything from Rivka, which is interesting. So again, it goes to this point that it was the fathers, the men of the house that, d- that did the deliberating. And it came to be when Abraham's servant heard their words that he bowed himself towards the earth before Yah. And the servant brought out the ornaments of silver and ornaments of gold and garments and gave them to Rivka. This is the chatan, the gift to the bride from the husband. He also gave costly gifts to her brother and her mother. There's your dowry, the moha. You you weren't just going to take the woman away from the house and not give. It says costly gifts. So remember how blessed Avraham was. So here we see the exchange, the gift to the bride and the gift to the parents. The giving of the chatan to the bride, the mohar to the bride's family. Let's keep going. And he and the men who were with him ate and drank and spent the night. And when, so there you have the covenant meal. So once the, the uh, agreement was set, you would have a meal. It was the equivalent of shaking the hand. You know, this deal is done. So you would share a meal, bread, wine. Um, just as a little side note, this is why in, uh, Paul says that we should not keep company with those who call themselves brothers or even eat with them. Those that call themselves brothers but you know, are in sexual sin and whore and um, they steal it. Basically false believers, they, they say the right thing but do because this idea of eating with meant that you were in covenant with. You were walking alongside them. This is why John says, those that do not bring the doctrine of Messiah, do not even bring them into your house. Because when you allowed someone into your house, you were saying, I trust this person. They're under my covering. We lose all this. When they arose in the morning, he said, let me go to my master. Now, this would have been the covenantal meal that would have followed the agreement. Uh, the terms were set. The terms were agreed. They sealed the deal. So now they're be- the, the, the woman is betrothed. She is going to be his wife. And Yitzhak, so th- this is, they now come back. This, you know, the servant comes back with Rivka. 
Yitzhak went out to meditate in the field in the evening and he lifted his eyes and looked and saw the camels coming. And Rivka lifted her eyes and when she saw Yitzhak, she dismounted from her camel and she said to the servant, who is this man walking in the field to meet us? And the servant said, it is my master. So she took a veil and covered herself. This idea of the veil was way, way, way back then. It's not a new thing. It had this idea of the, the symbolism is that when the husband lifted that veil, he was the one that was going to uncover that woman and bring her. It's part of being a union. It's a symbolic act. And the servant told Yitzhak all the matters that he had done. And Yitzhak brought her into his mother Sarah's tent and he took Rivka and she became his wife and he loved her. Thus Yitzhak comforted, was comforted after his mother's death. This thing of she was brought into the mother's tent is a euphemism. They're consummated. They are now fully man and wife living together. The story of Yaakov, all, so let's go and look at Yaakov now. That gives us much insight to how ancient wedding proceedings occurred in ancient times. This is in Genesis 29. Yaakov loved Rachel. So he said, let me serve you seven years for Rachel, your younger daughter. This is, the bride, uh, this is the bride price to the father, the moha. Remember, Yaakov has got nothing. He's ran away from home. He's got not one penny. So he sees Rachel. How do I pay you for the, for the dowry? I will work for it. Uh, dowries were not necessarily monetary. They could have been done in service, as we see here. And Levan said, it is better that I give her to you than I should give her to another man. Stay with me. So Yaakov served seven years for Rachel, and they seemed to him but a few days because of the love he had for her. At this point, they were betrothed, but there was no cohabitation. We, 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 we know from the story they're not consummated. Then Yaakov said to Levan, Give me my wife, for my days are completed, and let me go into her. Let me consummate the wedding. And Levan gathered all the men of the place and made a feast. We, we have the complete process here. This passage shows us every single step. Instead of waiting one year, though, he had to wait seven. The, this, basically, the man was only allowed to take the bride once the financial stipulations had been met, whatever that was set at. The terms of marriage were discussed between Yaakov and Levan. They discussed, okay, you can work for me seven years, that will be the bride price. The price for the bride was set at seven years' service, as Yaakov had no possessions. Once the terms were met, Yaakov was allowed to consummate his marriage and take his bride. But we know the story, you know, the switcheroo, so to speak. And it came to be in the evening that he took Leah, his daughter, and brought her to Yaakov, and he went into her. And Levan gave his female servant Zilpah to his daughter Leah as a female servant. And in the morning, it came to be that, see, it was Leah. So this, kind of, uh, this is my personal conviction. I think that Yaakov was pretty drunk at the time because he, to, to not recognize a woman that you've been working in the household for seven years, remember, they threw a great feast. You know, th th it's my conjecture, just throwing it out there for what it's worth. So he said to Levan, what is this that you have done to me? Was it not for Rachel that I served you? Why then have you deceived me? And Levan said, it is not done this way in our place to give the younger before the firstborn. Complete the week of this one. Then we give you this one too for the service which you shall serve me still another seven years. So how long was a wedding celebration? Seven days. Complete the week. So let, let's keep going with the festivities. Complete the week of Leah, which would have been the seven day wedding feast. Then you can have Rachel. But... You can, you're going to need to work another seven years. And Yaakov did so and completed her week. Then he gave him his daughter Rachel too as a wife. So completion of the week is the week-long celebration. Now, for Rachel, at least Levan gave him, you know, he said, you can have her now, but on the conditions of that you work for me another seven years. The terms for Yaakov to have Rachel were set again. Did the ladies have any input on this? No. 
Yaakov had to pay off another bride price before he could, say, before he could have his chosen bride. Because we, we know he didn't get his riches until after this event. So th- this is just like a basic, like we see these principles in scripture. Let's look at now how this can apply to us and to Yah. The ancient Hebrew wedding ceremony is a shadow of the plan of salvation for Elohim's people. And as we go through this series, this will become really apparent. Understanding these principles will help us understand our relationship to our creator. Let's now begin to look at how Elohim operated with these principles to select a bride. It's everywhere, like I said. So, who did um, Yah choose to be his people? Who was the father of Israel? The picture should give it away. Avraham. He chose Avraham, as we will see. Genesis 12. And Yah said to Avraham, Go to yourself out of your land, from your relatives and from your father's house, to a land which I will show you. And I shall make you a great nation and shall bless you and make your name great and you shall be a blessing. So he's choosing Avraham. He's taking him out, out of Babylon, by the way. Beautiful type and shadow of Yah taking us out of whatever Babylon is to us. And I shall bless those who bless you and curse him who curses you. And in you, all the clans of the earth shall be blessed. Elohim had found his match, so to speak. I pick you. The Shidruchin had taken place. The match had been made. It's like, I choose you. And specifically, your seed. Next chapter. And after Lot had separated from him, Yah said to Avram, Now lift up your eyes and look from the place where you are, northward and southward and eastward and westward. For all the land which you see, I shall give to you and your seed forever. And I shall make your seed as the dust of the earth, so that if a man could count the dust of the earth, then your seed also could be counted. Elohim has set the terms of what he will do for his bride. Remember that part of the ketubah, part of the conditions is what the man will do for the bride, and eventually what the bride will do for the man. Here we have the setting of conditions, but also with a, a gift, you will have this land. Genesis 17. And it came to be when Avram was 99 years old that Yah appeared to Avram and said to him, I am El Shaddai, walk before me and be perfect. And I give my covenant between me and you and shall greatly increase you. Elohim has set the terms of what he expects in return from his chosen. Walk before me and be perfect. Walk in integrity, be wholesome. Genesis 21, and Yah visited Sarah as he said, and Yah did for Sarah as he had spoken. So Sarah conceived and brought Avraham a son in his old age at the appointed time of which Elohim had spoken to him. And Avraham called the name of his son who was born to him, who Sarah bore to him, Yitzchak. Elohim has now given the chatan, the gift. He gave him a son in his old age, though he shouldn't have had one. I, I, it's amazing when you see, you're like, oh wow, the, the principles are all over. At this stage, remember the bride is still you, too young for consummation. It's like in the type and shadow here that we see, she's, she's not old enough to, con- to consummate. So what would happen? You have to wait until the bride is mature enough, which takes us to Mount Sinai. The groom's intentions are laid out again. Say therefore to the children of Israel, I am Yah, and I shall bring you out from under the burden of the Mitzrites, and I shall deliver you from their enslaving, and I shall redeem you with an outstretched arm and with great judgments. And I shall take you as my people and shall be your Elohim. This is where the four cups of wine in the Passover meal come from. And you shall know that I am Yah, your Elohim, who is bringing you out from under the burden of the Mitzrites. And I shall bring you into the land which I swore to give to Avraham, to Yitzhak, and to Yaakov, to give it to you as an inheritance. I am Yah. We see that he's now fulfilling the prom- he's starting to fulfill the promises he set out. This step was traditionally done before the formal proposal. You know, here are the conditions, this is what I want to do. Will you agree? Next we have the formal proposal. 
And now if you diligently obey my voice and shall guard my covenant, then you shall be my treasured possession above all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. If you say, I do, you will be my wife. And you shall be to me a reign of priests and a set-apart nation. Those are the words which you are to speak to the children of Israel. Then we have the bride's answer to the proposal. And Moshe came and called all the elders of the people and set before them all these words which Yah commanded him. And all the people answered together and said, All that Yah has spoken, we shall do. So Moshe brought back the words of the people to Yah. And if you read those chapters, they say, I do, three times. So by the mouth of two or three witnesses. Then there's preparation for the special day. Remember that in the preparation for the betrothal, they would undergo mikvah. And Yah said to Moshe, go to the people and set them apart today and tomorrow, and they shall wash their garments, and shall be prepared by the third day. For on the third day, Yah shall come down upon Mount Sinai before the eyes of all the people. The groom comes down, and he stands beneath the chuppah. So this is the betrothal stage still. And it came to be on the third day in the morning that there were thunders, lightnings, and a thick cloud over the mountain. I would argue that this is your chuppah, your canopy. And the sound of the ram's horn, again, a fanfare, was very loud, and all the people who were in the camp trembled. The groom then presents the wedding proposal through the friend of the bridegroom. And Moshe brought the people out of the camp to meet with Elohim, and they stood at the foot of the mountain. So, I think I've missed a verse there. (laughs) A shofar blast announces the day. We just read this. When the blast of the ram's horn sounded long and became louder and louder, Moshe spoke and Elohim answered him by voice. The consummation occurs. Now remember, in consummation, there was blood. And Moshe took half the blood, remember they've sacrificed a load of animals, put it in basins and half the blood he sprinkled on the altar. And he took the book of the covenant and read in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that Yah has spoken we shall do and obey. There's another I do. What do you think the book of the covenant is now in this picture? It's the Torah, which is the ketubah, the, the, the... Thank you. Sorry, my brain just went dead there. Is the conditions what the man will do for the bride and what the bride will do in return? I mean, if you read the blessings and curses, there's your perfect example. If you do these things, all this will follow. But if you don't do them, all that will follow. And Moshe took the blood and sprinkled it on the people and said, See the blood of the covenant which Yah has made with you concerning all these words. We even have two witnesses present. I have called the heavens and the earth as a witness against you today. I have set before you life and death and blessing and the curse. Therefore you shall choose life so that you live, both you and your seed. And to love Yah your Elohim, to obey his voice, to cling to him. For he is your life and the length of your days. To dwell in the land which Yah swore to your fathers, to Abraham, to Yitzhak and to Yaakov. To give them. And again, later on, assemble unto me all the elders of your tribes and your officers, so that I speak these words in their hearing and call the heavens and the earth to witness against them. You have your two witnesses. Now, this is as they're about to go into the land, the place that Yah had prepared for them. At this stage, Yisrael had not gone back to the place that the groom had prepared. They were still in the desert which means that they were still technically in the betrothal stage. The land was the place that Elohim had prepared for his bride. In Genesis 15, it says, He said to Avram, Know for certain that your seed are to be sojourners in the land that is not theirs, and shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years. But the nation whom they serve I am going to judge, and afterward let them come out with great possessions." Now as for you, you are to go to your fathers in peace. You are to be buried at a good old age. Then in the fourth generation they shall return here, for the crookedness of the Amorites is not yet complete. This is the nations they had to dispossess. Something had to be done first 
before Israel could move into that land. Yah had some preparations to do. Let's look at this. When a man has taken a new wife, let him not go out into the army, nor let any matter be imposed upon him. He shall be exempt one year for the sake of his home to rejoice with his wife whom he has taken. Now, the event with the 12 spies happens one year after they were delivered out of Egypt. One year. There was a full year. During that time, there was no war with other nations, apart from right at the very beginning when the Amalekites tried to get at the back and there was that whole incident with Amalek. But after that, you read the account, there's no war. It's not until a year has completed that they then send out the 12 spies. And what were they supposed to do? Go to war. No, the time that was meant for rejoicing was turned into a time of misery due to, a, and I put here, a nagging wife. The Israelites, they were complainers, constantly backbiting Yah, not trusting in him. Right? Yah says, these 10 times these people have, have tried me. This was meant to be the time when they enjoyed each other's company. Let's take this back to the garden. And when Yeshua himself began, he was about 30 years of age, being as reckoned by law, son of Yosef, son of Eli, and then you read down the generation, of Enosh, of Sheth, of Adam, of Elohim. I've missed out the, you know, all the verses. Adam's father was Elohim. Up until uh, this point, men were always called son of man, son of man, son of man. Only Adam was son of Elohim. Now, in Genesis 2.18, it says, Yah Elohim said, it is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. You have the father, again, choosing a bride for his son. And this is Yeshua. What is Yeshua called? The second Adam. We have a form here of shiduchin, of matchmaking. And it was the father that did it. Now, just a thought. What we just read here about when a man has a new wife, he has to be with her one year before he goes out to war. Does this imply that Adam and Eve were in the garden for one year before the fall? Just a thought. It's, it's a con interesting, it's a conjecture. But it would make sense because everyone thinks, oh, well, how, we like to think this. How long were they in the garden? I'm taking an educated guess here. Just thought I'd throw it out there for what it's worth. Now, in Genesis 2, Yah Elohim said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I am going to make a helper for him as his counterpart. And from the ground, Yah Elohim formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called each living creature, that was its name. So the man gave the names all to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But for the man, there was not found a helper for him as his counterpart. So Yah Elohim caused a deep sleep to fall on the man, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. And the rib which Yah Elohim had taken from the man, he made into a woman, and he brought her to the man. And the man said, this is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. This one is called woman because she was taken out of man. In Hebrew, she's called Isha because she was taken out of Ish, Ish, Isha. For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And as they were both naked, the man and his wife, and they were not ashamed. Now, this is a beautiful type and shadow. Beautiful type and shadow of Messiah and his bride. Now, I, I have to give a little credit to, um, to Jeff Githens on this. We've been in our private time going through Genesis 1 to 4 and really pulling it apart and uh, so some of this credit to you Jeff Yeshua was called the second Adam Paul clearly says Yeshua was the second Adam and compares him to Adam now Adam was put into a deep sleep which is a type and shadow of death now a Messiah the second Adam had to die a wound was created in his side and Yah took one of the ribs and closed up the flesh in its place. So Adam had a wound 
What happened to Yeshua up on the cross? He had a spear in his side. The result of this was a bride for Adam. The result of him going, of dying, of having a fleshly wound and then that being closed up. The result of the death of Messiah and blood and water pouring out from his side is a bride fit for the king. It's a beautiful type and shadow. It's amazing. I'm going to leave it there because now in the next part, I want to start looking at how this marriage ceremony applies to us and to Messiah. We'll look at Messiah's words and we'll start tying it to Passover and a lot of the enigmatic things that our Messiah said. And at some point, we'll maybe delve a bit more into Adam and Eve. Amen. 